Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Horn Call podcast. My name is James Bolden, Publications Editor for the International Horn Society, and your host. Welcome, everyone, to 2022. This is our first episode of the new year, and it's going to be a good one. My guest today is Larry Williams, a multifaceted performer, teacher, um, very talented person all around. He brings uh, a, a very interesting background. He's actually served as an administrator at Johns Hopkins University for some uh, some time, um, kind of in between his, uh, his career as a performing artist and teacher. I had a wonderful conversation with Larry. He's such a great storyteller and is able to articulate his ideas so clearly that uh, I think you're just going to be captivated by his speaking. Um, I will say that if, if the audio sounds a little bit uh, wonky on on your end, I'm recording this uh, while I'm out of town. It's actually um, uh, not my normal setup, but I, I hope that this is going to be suitable. And uh, uh, I, I hope that you enjoy listening to this conversation with Larry Williams. And I hope that you have a safe, healthy and bountiful new year. like to start these conversations by having my guests talk a little bit about what they're doing right now and maybe sort of you know just in, in recent recent past what what kinds of things you've been doing relative to the horn sure well first thanks for having me on um, very very happy to talk to you um, happy to be on the podcast uh, so my my career is divided up into a whole bunch of different buckets like most folks um, I have uh, my performance stuff that I do. Um, I have some administration that I do, and I have some teaching that I do, and then I have a whole bunch of other things that are too many buckets to to, to categorize. But um, I'll I'll just start with the um, I guess I'll start with the performance um, stuff. So I I play in several orchestras. I'm based now in uh, Vienna, Virginia, which is right outside Washington D.C. And uh, we moved here from um, further north, uh, closer to Baltimore, Maryland, uh, right as COVID hit, we, we decided to move. Um, and the reason why the timing uh, worked out that way is because I had been uh, serving as an assistant vice provost for faculty affairs at Johns Hopkins University for two years. Um, and that was after teaching uh, chamber music and horn in the Peabody Conservatory and the Peabody Preparatory for about 25 years. Mm -hmm. And so um, when I, you know, working backwards, I taught at Peabody and I had enjoyed um, playing and teaching and, 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 you know, doing my music thing. But I, I also felt like um, it was time for me to challenge myself and to expand my network and expand my skill set. And I didn't want to leave music. I, I never intended on stopping um, my teaching and I never intended on not playing. I just got this feeling and I, I just had this inner voice telling me it's time to grow. It's time to challenge yourself. And I, so I just kept my eyes open for opportunities. And one day I saw an opportunity while I was at Peabody an email came across uh, and it, it was about this fellowship opportunity for a, uh, a faculty member, any faculty member in the university who was interested in working in the provost's office. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this had nothing to do with music, um, uh, but I decided to apply for it. Um, my initial feeling was, yeah, I'll apply for it. I'm not going to get it. You know, they're not going to, they're certainly not going to pick a, a know a Peabody person they're not going to pick a musician it's probably going to go to a scientist or a Hubble Space Telescope person or what all the other you know super super uh, scientists and, and uh, tech people at Hopkins um, long story short I got picked for it and so I was still teaching at Peabody but part-time I started working in the provost office I didn't even know what a provost office was <laughs> really honestly before I took this job uh, I quickly found out what the provost office uh, was and, and what the provost in a university did. And it was really interesting. 
Um, but it was also extremely challenging because I was I didn't have a horn in my hand and I wasn't teaching horn players. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I was very much, you know, not an expert um, at all in anything. I felt really, really dumb all the time in every meeting. Um, but I, I did my best to try to keep up and catch up. And everybody there was very, um, very um, welcoming and, 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 and you know, patient with me. Um, long story short, I stayed there um, and eventually was appointed assistant vice provost for faculty affairs, which, um, which was an, a really amazing opportunity and, and it really did challenge me. And, and I grew a lot through that. I was still playing and teaching, uh, but not as much as I, I had before. Um, but my goal when I took that job was to probably do it for maybe two years, three at the most, and then transition back to horn playing and, and teaching full time, which is which are my passions. Um, and so after a couple of years, I was like, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's about that time. <laughs> I think I've done, you know, I, I have not burnt the school down to, you know, to the ground and, you know, I haven't been fired. So, it, yeah, I think it's time to get out of here while I still can. But it quickly dawned on me, like, I don't have a, um, <laughs> I don't have an escape plan <laughs> here. How do I get back? I don't know. Sure. I mean, you know, and so that was, that was something that I, 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 I got increasingly anxious about, you know, how do I transition back um, to my playing and my teaching? So I made a, you know, I, I, I reconnected with lots of friends and, and told folks, yeah, I want to come back to playing and teaching if there's any opportunities and and, and there were some um, that presented themselves and that made me feel, you know, a little bit better. But, you know, it was still very uncertain. And I, and I knew that there was going to be a price for me to pay for stepping away for a couple of years and that I was going to have to, you know, repay my dues in a lot of ways. But I was, I was fine with that. I was ready for that. I've done that before and I wasn't worried about it. Um, so I was, I was optimistic and I had, you know, I was setting up, you know, some teaching, uh, appointments and and you know trying to you know get some gigs back that I used to do um, and then I left the university uh, I left that position and literally the week that I was transitioning out is when COVID hit mm. and I was seeing these emails you know uh, in terms of the administration at Hopkins going around talking about right. this COVID uh, situation it, it was not a full outbreak at that point in time but they were already working on, you know, working on it. Mm -hmm. And I was privy to seeing, um, you know, some of the planning and, and, and stuff that was going on, which was very fascinating and also very scary at the same time. Um, and then here I was kind of transitioning out <laughs> right when everything was happening. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know if it was good timing or bad timing for me, but, um, you know, long story short, a lot of the plans that I had made in terms of kind of, um, transitioning back to teaching and playing, obviously they, they all got blown up because no one was doing any teaching and playing. And so I, you know, I leaned on some previous experience that I had doing online teaching, which I did many, many years ago um, uh, through Peabody. Um, and I started to teach lessons online and um, I was really comfortable doing it. I had done it before, so it was really no big deal. As a matter of fact, it was great for me because previously when I had taught online, the software that I was using was so ancient and uh. so unbelievably horrible. I mean, like <laughs> every five minutes, the, 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 the call would just end. How it wasn't just... Yeah. yeah, it wasn't just foggy or, you know, the, the volume wasn't right. It was like the, the call would just end. You would oh be done. Goodness. And so this, so, you know, I got on Zoom and I was like, oh, wow, this, this is this is actually really nice. This is, yeah. I don't know what everybody's complaining about. <laughs> this is great. Um, so anyway, long story short, um, you know, between uh, teaching and doing some workshops and master classes, um, for Yamaha, I, I actually turned out, it turned out to be a really busy year um, doing that kind of work mm -hmm. online. Um, so that was good. I mean, you know, it wasn't the transition back that I had planned, but it definitely was a transition back to teaching, um, not so much playing, um, but, but at least teaching, which, which is for me, like just, just as fun as, as performing. Um, so, um, you know, 
when I left that job at Hopkins, um, because my wife works in DC and I no longer needed to get north to Baltimore, uh, the timing was right for us to move. So, so that's how I ended up here right outside of DC. Mm-hmm. And I was uh, really fortunate to uh, be offered a teaching position at Washington Adventist University, which is a small university uh, right outside DC. And I have uh, several friends uh, on the faculty there and I've known about the music program there for, for years. And uh, I've got some really great horn students and we're trying to build the studio out. Um, I, I, I really enjoy um, building, you know, I enjoy recruiting, I enjoy building programs. So um, it's a really, really great uh, situation for me um, to be there right now. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's really been um, pretty pretty cool in terms of the performing opportunities kind of coming back uh, online. I actually didn't think online, quote unquote, um, I, I actually didn't think that I was going to be doing much performing this year just because of the way things are with COVID. But, um, but a lot of the orchestras that I play in are performing and I'm, I'm on, I'm involved in, you know, uh, several tours and I've, I've done a lot of playing already. Um, so, um, it's it's actually turning out to be a really wonderful year. Um, I'm going to get to go to Carnegie Hall in in April with the Gateways Festival Orchestra, oh, that's um, awesome. and we're going to make our Carnegie uh, debut, which will be very exciting. Um, an orchestra that I started years ago now called American Studio Orchestra. It's a multimedia ensemble. Um, we have been granted a residency at the Kennedy Center in D.C in june uh for about a week we will basically be there um in their new uh facility called the reach which is this really beautiful high-tech multi uh media multi-use space so for us it's like the ultimate playground and we're going to have the use of all of their facilities like for an entire week and they're going to staff it for us we can pretty much do whatever we want so we're going to host a really, really cool um, music festival um, that's going to be based on collaboration, which is oh, that's kinda, awesome. Yeah. 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 So lots of fun things coming up. That's great. And that, that's a, such an incredible trajectory of a, of a career, even in just like the last three or four years, you know, um, as you were talking about sort of your transition into an admin job and then out of it back into performing and teaching, a couple of questions occurred to me and, you know, you can be as detailed or as not detailed as you want. You might, you might, there might be folks you prefer not to name as far as <laughs> things you had to deal with in an administrative job. So feel free to leave out whatever you need to. But so going into that job is probably like kind of being thrown into the ocean, right? Or being thrown into the deep end of the pool. There's no, there's no like training other than on the job training to just be in an administrative position like that. But did you find that anything that any of the skills or, you know, things that you had learned being a working professional musician and teacher for all those years, anything that you were pleasantly surprised by that like, Hey, I, I'm adaptable if nothing else. Were were there things that stuck out to you transitioning into that job? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So the, the interesting thing about working in, in the provost's office was that the people that I worked with were all professors, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they were either currently, um, uh, you know, appointed professors at Johns Hopkins, or they had had previous careers as professors. Um, so none of them, I mean, you know, the people that I worked with on a, on a direct, you know, level, were, you know, all of them had a, had a, had a background in teaching, mm-hmm. um, teaching and or research. Um, and so I could relate to them, even though my subject area was very different than theirs. Mm-hmm. We had that in common, which helped. Um, and they were really curious, you know, to talk to me about what it's like to be a music professor. And of course, I was extremely curious to find out, you know, what it's like to be a, you know, global uh Bionuclear physicist or whatever, you know, um, and it, it was fascinating. Um, but you know, one of the things that they told me when I came on um, and feeling quite stupid um, was that 
you know, they all went through the same thing when, <laughs> when they started working in there. Um, and they just said, you know, they're like, you just said, there's no training for this kind of job. You just <laughs> learn on, on the fly and we'll be here to help you out and just ask questions and just be you. And, um, what I, what I quickly, uh, figured out that helped me out a lot was that even though I was not a subject matter expert on any of the things that they were talking about, I did understand the universal truths about, you know, what faculty members writ large um, think about, what they care about, what they are going through. Um, it's the same across all the disciplines. Um, so I felt, because my office was faculty affairs. I felt like, okay, well, I do know what it's like to be a faculty member. I've taught here for 25 years mm -hmm. and I've talked with many, many other faculty, you know, for those 25 years. So that is something I actually feel like I can talk about. But more important than that, um, what I started figuring out is um, my collaborative skills, my, my, you know, desire to work on a team, um, and fill a role on that team was not universal. Some people really liked to collaborate and some people really did not like to collaborate. Mm -hmm. And in music, everybody collaborates, mm -hmm. right? Even if you don't want to collaborate, you're collaborating, yeah. right? You, you, you don't have a choice. And so for, for us, that's just, you know, that's, that's a given, right? That at the very least, you're going to work with other people, um, you know, for the benefit of the greater good, right? Um, but I was exposed to situations where I worked with people for the first time that never collaborated at all. They were really just really super siloed and that's how they worked. It was nothing wrong with it. Um, you know, some of, some of it was because of the field that they're in. You know, they might have been like researchers where that's what they thought they pretty much spent their whole careers alone. You know, mm -hmm. that's that's how they got there is by being <laughs> right. alone, you know. Right. And I'm like, wow, I, I got here like literally the opposite way. Right. Mm -hmm. So it took me a while when I picked up on, uh, you know, the fact that people were not open to collaborating uh, with me. My first reaction was, wow, man, they don't like me. You know, this is like, I, they don't, they don't like me or they don't respect me or, you know, it's me, you know, and it took me a while, but I finally figured out, no, it's not that they don't like you. It's just that they speak a different language and you don't speak this language. Mm -hmm. And I, and some of it, I figured out on my own. Some of it, I actually was, was taught in some workshops that I took, um, where they explained the different communication styles and different ways of being, um, many more, uh, you know, prototypes than, than exist in the music world. You know, we mm -hmm. think we know all the prototypes, you know, the string player, the brass player. <laughs> there, there's like a hundred more um, and they're very different. Um, but anyway, um, so in terms of the skills that, that I brought, that I leaned on, um, my collaboration skills, my desire to, to you know, get things done as a, you know, as a member of a team, um, you know, it, was I think useful and helpful um, in that atmosphere because um, that you know that was somewhat unique in in that in that office. They weren't mm -hmm. really used to having someone say, "Okay, well, how are we going to do this?" or you know, "Who's you know who wants to do this?" or whatever. Um, and I think that you know that was part of the reason why they brought me in there um, is to is to do that. Um, and so, um, I never really thought much about, you know, that, that collaboration is a skill that I have as a musician until I started hanging out with people are, that are not musicians. Yep. And then I realized, oh, okay, well, this is, this is what I can bring to the table. I can see how it, it could help, you know, if you'll, if you'll let me do my thing here, it, it, it will actually you know, help a little bit. So I, I did my best to, to bring that. Um, and that helped me feel like I had, uh, something to contribute of value. Um, and I leaned on that a lot. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then I felt like, okay, so 
I get it. This is this is like being in a really weird orchestra, you know, <laughs> <laughs> where it, you know I I don't have a section. I am a section, and every individual is their own section, you know. And there's like seventy five different sections, and we have to work. So, I kind of figured out a way to make it work in my in my musician head, um, so that it made sense. Because before that, I just felt isolated, you know, and 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 somewhat. You know, um, somewhat um, anxious. You know that I just didn't know um, what everybody else knew. Over time, I, I I found out that nobody knew everything. Mm. You know, everybody had the you know the their things that they had experience with, and then there was always something that they didn't. So I, it wasn't just me, but I didn't know that. You know, until I I was there for a while. But um, the, the the way that I guess the way that I was used to communicating and collaborating and listening these are things that you know i learned you know you know in my career as a as a musician and you know they are part of my everyday life um and i didn't really think twice about it until it was pointed out to me like you know wow you're really you know you're really collaborative you know that's that's <laughs> that's really great and i was like what like you're not <laughs> like how how do you function and and so it was a learning experience and it was exactly what i wanted it to be um it was it was one of those experiences i you know that um you know i've learned to listen to to my inner voice when it talks to me and and whispers something over and over again i didn't used to always listen to it but i i kind of do now and my voice was saying, even though you might actually hate this experience, <laughs> you've got to do this because you're going to come out of it stronger. And when you come back, you know, when I come back to my, my music career, I'm going to come back to it with a whole different skill set and a different outlook on things. And it's only going to make me, you know, stronger and, and better and more adaptable and flexible and and you know it's just it's it's going to be fine the the issue with with it was as i said before how do i transition back that that became you know right. something that that you know that i had to figure out then i finally figured that out and then covid hit and oh, so yeah. that's just you know and so that just kicked off the you know you know a whole bunch of other transitions which we can we can talk about mm -hmm. Now, that's that's an amazing and it's such a cool story, too. And that was going to be my very next question is like the flip side of that coin as you were making your way back into the, the teaching and performing work. What what things were you bringing from your work as in an administrative office like a provost office? Mm -hmm. What things did you find that were actually helpful to you that you might not have had those skills or that experience before? It's a good question. So the first thing is that. Now I'm back amongst my tribe, uh, you know, my collaboration tribe, and mm -hmm. and it just felt so amazingly good <laughs> to feel like um, I'm supposed to do what I'm doing, as opposed to oh he's doing that collaboration thing. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's cute. Um, so it, it it's just been a feeling of uh, you know joy, mm -hmm. yeah, you, know, you know to to be back with my friends and to be back with folks who are frankly a little bit more like me. Um, in terms of what, I, what I've what i learned is, um, you know, I guess I got to see how um, a large organization um, is set up and how it's run. And I, I got this backstage pass to uh, see a university from a perspective that um, is very different than, than I had as a faculty member or as a student. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a lot more understanding now of um, how decisions are made mm -hmm. that eventually affect faculty and students that I did not understand, you know, that, and that is a universal reality of being a faculty member you know you know your day to day you know your class you know your roster or whatever but mm -hmm. you know there's there's people above you making decisions and you don't you, you know, sometimes you have no idea why 
why mm -hmm. they do what they do. <laughs> now I know why they do what they do. <laughs> And it's complicated, you know, and yep. it, it, it turned out that it's not it, it's not exactly what I thought. But um, that having that perspective of, of knowing what what's going on at the administrative level at a, at a, a big uh, research university and being able to see an organization or an, or in this case, a university kind of from the 10,000 foot level where it, you know, I could see all of the different schools and not just Peabody, you know, and see all of these different deans and see the faculty and see what's going on in each one of these uh, schools and which what's going on at the, at the departmental level. And then also, you know, be involved in conversations about uh, the future of the entire university. Mm -hmm. it, it, it gave me a perspective. It gave me some some interesting um, perspective on um, decision making and strategy you mm -hmm. know? and so um you know as i said i like to build I, I like to build new programs i like to innovate and and you know i'm i'm like the person that's always like hey let's try this you know why don't we do this um i i have a new idea every five seconds and you know some of them are decent <laughs> <laughs> but but i but they keep coming um and so anyway um I guess that's what I would say that that I'm I'm grateful for is that I can now kind of slow when I do have an idea. I can now kind of slow myself down a little bit and incorporate some of the uh, knowledge that I've gained um, in that position um, because I can see some of the the potential roadblocks and potential barriers that you know that are going to have to be. Uh, removed in order to have success, I can see them from way far away, as opposed to just like, "Hey guys, let's do this," and then launching into something, and then a year later or two years later, you run into this wall. Now I can be like, "Yeah, when we're setting this up, let's set it up so we don't have to run into this wall." Mm -hmm. um, and so it's that kind of experience that that I'm really grateful for. Yeah, and it it strikes me there. There must be something about just sort of the mental strength it takes to persevere as a horn player because it i mean there i can name at least four or five individuals like yourself who were professional horn players who then went into administrative roles mm -hmm. you know that's got to be more than the average i mean and it's just it funny uh, there's got to be a connection there of just the being able to persevere to have a plan to be collaborative when you need to be but then also being able to like you know, focus in on a task and just finish it when it needs to get done. And maybe nobody else is interested in helping you mm -hmm. <laughs> that so often that happens in those that, roles where you're like, nobody's yeah. going to help me do this, but me, and I've got to just get this done. So it really is, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever done any research on this, but I, I have, I have found the same thing that you're talking about, that there's a lot of horn players that, that, that you know, that tend to drift out of our lane. Um, and do other stuff um and you know have pretty good success at, at other stuff too and i think that you know it's it, who knows which which came first the chicken or the egg you know i don't know if the horn pl horn playing makes you more resilient so that you can you know kind of jump in and out of lanes mm -hmm. or if you're just a resilient person and that's why you pick the horn in the first place i don't know <laughs> But it is true um, that 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 you know horn horn players are resilient creatures, um, mm -hmm. and we are also very curious uh, curious about how things uh, work, and and we're curious about people, and we're and you know we are great teammates and team members, but we can also fly solo when we have to, and sometimes we have to. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, so yeah, I think there is something to it. I've never really been able to figure out what it is. I'm almost afraid to try to find out what it is, but right. um, but I agree that I've seen I've seen that too, and and I do lean on my my horn playing experience um, in everything that I do. Um, and obviously, you know, when I'm playing my horn, I'm in my happy happy place, um, and you know, it's uh, it's always challenging, but it's always fun. Mm -hmm. Now, I've got to ask, and I, I usually ask most of my guests this because it, it is such an interesting question. And 
maybe talk a little bit about when you were coming up as a young horn player and kind of thinking about, you know, is this going to be a career for me? And what, what does a career even look like as a professional musician? Because I, I was from a small town and, you know, sort of the pre big internet age, like, like a lot of people. Um, I just didn't really know what a career looked like other than to like pick up the horn call or, you know, occasionally go to a, a, an orchestra concert or something. So who were your role models? Who were the, the folks that you looked to, to maybe sort of try to follow in their footsteps or that you thought, well, you know, if I could do something like what that person is doing, that would be kind of cool. Yeah. I was, I was a really late bloomer. I was completely clueless um, in, in high school about the horn. Um, I started playing the trumpet in fourth grade and I was really bad at it, but it was fun. And I got <laughs> to sit next to my best friend who was just a little bit better than me. Uh, we got to middle school together and we were still pretty bad at it, but still having fun. <laughs> um, and then the band director asked, you know, for volunteers to, you know, try the horn. We didn't have any horn players. I don't think I'd ever even seen a French horn before she pulled this thing out. And when she did pull it out, I think I, I, I probably laughed. I mean, I, I was like, that is the ugliest, most ridiculous. Like, no one is going to raise their hand. That is hideous. Like, what is that? Um, and to my shock and horror, my best friend raises his hand to volunteer to try to play the wow. French horn. And I was like, what are you doing, dude? So he, 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 she, she gets him set up. He plays like two notes. And she was like, okay, he's going to be our horn player. We need, we need another volunteer. And I was like, what is this? What, is, what just happened? Like my reason for being in the band right. just moved, you know, to another section. And um, so I, I did that analysis. And I, so I raised my hand mm -hmm. and I volunteered to, you know, it's like, if he can do it, I guess I'll do it. <laughs> and she looked at me and she's like, oh. And I was like, yeah, I'll try it. And she was like, are you sure you want to try the... And I was like, yeah, you know, I was like, what, what's going on? So all, all, all the kids in the band now are starting to snicker. And I'm like, what is this? What, what, what is going on here? And she was like, are you sure you don't want to try? You know, and she named like saxophone or the trombone or something. And I was like, no, I want to, let me try it. And she tells me, you know, okay, look, we don't have time right now. So come after school and we'll see. Uh -huh. And of course, all of the kids are laughing, you know, and I couldn't understand like, why is it? that my friend raises his hand, you know, and he plays two notes and he's the new horn section. Right. Mm -hmm. And I raised my hand and I got to come after school. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of upset. Uh, and I go after school and she's like, Oh, that's right. Okay. So let's get you set up and see how you do. Long story short, the, the horn, uh, instantly was infinitely easier for me to play than the trumpet. Oh, wow. And I was shocked by uh, the fact that I could do some stuff on it. And my band director was shocked. What I didn't know was that my band director was also a professional horn player. Hmm. She didn't tell us that she was a horn player herself, but she was not only a professional horn player, but she had a huge uh, private studio and it was really just world famous. I mean, her, the kids from her studio eventually you know won jobs at major symphonies they got scholarships to all the major conservatories around the world i didn't know any of this stuff mm -hmm. um so i started to play the horn she asked me to study with her in her studio and i was like i'm just not <laughs> I was like i'll play in the band but i'm just not that into the horn so mm -hmm. no thank you <laughs> um and i and of course I, had i really known that she was like this world famous horn pedagogue and she was offering me this unbelievable chance i probably would have said yes <laughs> but i didn't know and i was dumb and so i was like nah i don't wanna um so we i we we continued to play horn together in middle school got to high school kept on playing um i never took any lessons i got to my senior year of high school and um my friends are all talking about where they're going to apply to college and stuff. And someone asked me where I, where I was going to apply. And I was like, I don't even know. And she was like, what are you going to major in? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> now, at that point in time, I was, I was the drum major in the, in the band. And I was playing in the, in the band and the orchestra. I was playing my horn a lot. So it wasn't really that serious about it, but I liked it. you mm -hmm. know. Um, and she was like, oh, you're really good at that French horn thing. Why don't you major in music? And I looked at her and I was like, yeah, I probably, I probably would major in music if you could major in music. And she's <laughs> like, yeah, you can major in music. And I was like, oh, I didn't know you could. This is 
who I was. I mean, I had no idea you could even major in music. Mm -hmm. My older sister at the time was at Oberlin and she was studying theater and political science, which is a typical Oberlin double major, mm -hmm. right? So I called my sister and I was like, hey, can you major in music? Is there, is there a music major at, at Oberlin? She was like, oh, you're so stupid. You're so stupid. You know, big sister. <laughs> she, went, she, she went off on me and she was like, you're so dumb. Yes, you can major in music. Yes, you know, Oberlin has like the best music school in the world and <laughs> you'll never get in here. And, you know, pretty much hung up the phone, you know, just typical big sister stuff. <laughs> so I talked to my mom about it and she was like, you know, your, your middle school band director is a horn player. You know, you should, you should call her. If you're serious about doing this, you should call her and ask her what you should do. And I was like, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to call her <laughs> because I knew that if I did call her, she was going to chew me out for not taking lessons all these years. Right. And I, I didn't want to have that conversation <laughs> with her, but, uh, Anyway, I did call her and I told her, yeah, I want to major in music. And I guess I'm supposed to take an audition or something someplace. And my mom said, I'm supposed to talk to you. And <laughs> she, uh, she, she brought me into her studio, which was in her home. And she gave me a, a crash course in horn playing. And, um, you know, I could do some stuff with the horn, but I was really super green, you know. Um, and what she did for me and to me <laughs> over the, the, the next couple of months was, was both incredible and, and, and scary. She, she, some, of, some of the things that she had me doing, I'm convinced were just punitive. <laughs> I mean, there was like, I don't think there was any education about it. It was punishment. Um, some really old school um, exercises and stuff, just, just crazy stuff. Um, but she, she made it really clear to me that, you know, if I committed to this, mm -hmm. that I, I could I could get to a point where I'm ready to take auditions for college. And so I auditioned for um, I auditioned for two schools. Um, I auditioned at Oberlin because my sister went there and she said that they had a good music school and I, that was good enough for me, even though she said I'd never get in. And I auditioned at Penn State because mm -hmm. I grew up in Maryland and I watched Penn State football games and I knew that Penn State had a really good marching band, which huh. meant a lot to me at the time. Mm -hmm. That is how I selected uh, my, my schools for college. And I only auditioned for two uh, because I didn't realize that um, it was very unlikely that I was going to get into either one of those schools. Mm -hmm. So again, I was completely clueless um, about what I was doing and what I was uh, trying to accomplish. Um, uh, they pretty much threw me out of Oberlin <laughs> in my audition. Uh, the professor was like, yeah, you know, I, you're, you've got some talent, but you're like a couple of years away. And you're, you know, he, he, he told me to my face, he was like, you're not going to be a horn player. You're going to find something else to do. You're smart. And you're going to find something else to do, and that would be great. But more or less, your window has closed, and you're too late. Mm. And I was so naive that when he told me that, it didn't really sink in that <laughs> he was basically telling me, you have no chance at ever being a musician. All I heard was, you, you, you got a late start. Like, mm. in, that's, what, that's how my, <laughs> my brain filtered his comments. Um, so I went off to my audition at Penn State, which was a totally different uh, environment. And they were like, yeah, we'll give you a full scholarship. And the reason why is because the year that I auditioned, they had just graduated a whole bunch of horn players. So they were looking. Uh -huh. And I didn't know. I mean, I lucked into it. They were looking and I showed up. And um, so I, I went to Penn State for two years on a full scholarship. And that was the first time that I got really serious about actually playing the horn and learning it. Mm -hmm. um, it was the first time I heard really, really good horn players that had been playing the horn all their lives. And I quickly realized, oh my God, I suck. I mean, I am, <laughs> I am bad. I mean, I thought I was like average. I'm not even close. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to really work hard to like keep this scholarship. And my mom, you know, told me, you know, you're, you're not coming home. So you better, you better keep that scholarship because you're not coming back home. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, uh, I worked my butt off uh, for a couple of years with the thought that 
I can't lose this scholarship, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and after two years, I had pretty much caught up to where I should have been. And I was, I was playing with a graduate brass quintet and playing in all these different ensembles and having a great old time. And, and somebody, I can't remember who it was anymore, but somebody said, yeah, Larry, you know, you're, you're getting really good. You know, maybe you should go think about going to a conservatory, you know, mm -hmm. maybe you should transfer to conservatory. And I, again, I didn't really know what that meant. So I did a little bit of research and someone said, yeah, well, you're from Maryland. Why don't you go to Peabody? You know, mm -hmm. and I was like, I, what's Peabody? I don't know what Peabody is. I didn't know what Peabody was at the time. Um, so long story short, I applied to Peabody. I got in and basically the same thing happened to me again when I got to Peabody. I got there and I heard horn playing at a level that I had not heard before. And again, I thought to myself, oh my God, I really suck. Like I, I, I thought that I was getting better, but it's, actually this is even worse. I'll never be able to catch up to these guys. Um, so I just put my head down and, and just grinded, you know, grind, grinded it out, um, mm -hmm. finished my bachelor's degree there, went on to do a, a graduate performance diploma. Um, I auditioned for New World Symphony while I was, uh, I think it was probably when, in my junior year and I got in, but um, there were no openings. Like I got in, but I was mm -hmm. waiting for one of the horn players in New World to leave and they didn't leave for years. Mm -hmm. So by the time I finished my um my, my performance diploma, um, I had gotten in, but there was no opening. And um, I was at the Music Academy of the West uh, that summer, and I got a call saying, yeah, we want you to fly into Miami. Um, you know, this is going to be your basically your final audition. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait a minute. I thought that, they, I, thought that I was in. Why do, why do I have to do it? I thought I did the final audition. What, what, what is this? And Apparently, there was now a horn opening, but they were flying me and this other horn player from mm -hmm. Eastman down, and it was like a, a playoff between oh, the wow. two of us. Yeah. So uh, that was a really interesting experience. We ended up both getting in, and uh, they kind of you know expanded the section, and then somebody else got a job, and so it worked out beautifully. Um, I played in New World for two seasons and loved it. Um, and it was everything that I thought it was going to be and everything that I wanted to do for a living. Um, I was offered a, my first teaching position in Miami uh, while I was in the orchestra at Florida International University. Mm -hmm. um, I had no idea whether I could teach or not or whether I should teach or not, but they gave me the opportunity to do it. And it turned out that I loved teaching. It was, it was like, it was just as fun as performing for me. And I, that was a surprise. I always figured, yeah, someday in the future, maybe I'll do some teaching, you know, like my teacher plays in the orchestra, you know, maybe that'll happen for me. But teaching wasn't really a priority for me uh, when I was studying in school. So when I started to teach and I realized, oh, wow, I really love this. It was a pleasant, a pleasant surprise. Mm -hmm. um, the other surprise was that, um, at that time, I was playing in the symphony, had my teaching position. I was now playing in a, in a brass quintet in town. I was doing a little bit of freelancing in town. I was doing a lot of different things, um, not just playing in the orchestra. And I was, you know, juggling all these balls, and I liked it. I, I liked the challenge of it. I liked the fact that, you know, sometimes I'm teaching, sometimes I'm doing chamber music, sometimes I'm playing a show, and sometimes I'm playing in the symphony all these really cool people and, and challenges and I'm growing and, and I realized that, yeah, this is, this is actually what, what works for me mm -hmm. is doing a lot of different things. And I, that was new because up until that point, I was a, I was a horn, I was an orchestral horn player. I mean, that's mm -hmm. all I wanted to do. And that's kind of all that I did. And I was happy about it. But um, all of these other things um, turned out, you know, when you put them all together, they made me even happier. Mm -hmm. um, and so right before my third year of my fellowship uh, started at New World, um, I told them that I was not going to take, I was not going to stay for my third year. Mm -hmm. And the reasons why were because I've got a full-time teaching job, I'm playing in a professional brass quintet, I'm freelancing in town, I'm kind of doing like everything that I like to do right now. Um, I don't I don't want to give this up. 
Right. Um, and so, uh, so that's what I did, you know, and I just, I invested in, in, in that kind of multifaceted career and I just kept on uh, going because nobody stopped me. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Larry, I don't want to take up too much more of your time today. I think, again, thank you for being so generous and, and speaking with me. I have, I have two kind of sort of summary questions to kind of wrap things up, if that would be okay. Sure. So the, the, the first one is you'd mentioned, you know, your, your passion, one of your passions is sort of building programs and recruiting. And I think that's anybody that teaches at any college in, in, in the United States and probably in other places as well, is that's something on your mind. Like how do you, what's a recruiting strategy that's proven that works? What are some philosophies about recruiting and building programs? Do you have any advice or anything that in your experience that that's been helpful to you? Well, I, I would say in terms of recruiting, um, y- you know, all of the above. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not familiar with one or two strategies that that work. Um, you have to think long term, um, you know, for for example, the, the university that I'm teaching at now, I've been there for one year um, and I'm now the coordinator for brass winds and percussion. And I've I have. Um, kind of mapped out a three-year strategy mm-hmm. um, because I think it's going to take us at least that long to really see the results of the seeds that we're, we're planting. Mm-hmm. Um, the first thing that I've done is is kind of invest in the faculty. And, mm-hmm. and maybe this is to answer your earlier question about what I what I've learned in terms of working in, in the administrative side. Um, what what I'm doing is investing in the faculty and getting the faculty, um, you know, making sure that the faculty are, um, are, are buying in and, and take ownership of the recruiting process Mm. as opposed to it coming from, you know, an administrator or a department chair or a coordinator, um, that, that they can see that this is in their interest to participate in it, Mm -hmm. um, get them excited about it and support them, give them the things that they need. Um, then the other piece is, you know, get, getting the students out and about and exposing the students to, to potential recruits. In other Mm -hmm. words, the best recruiters for our program are our students and our faculty. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we are, you know, that's what we're doing, um, is, is, you know, we're going out into schools and we're trying to bring the, the, the kids, you know, in the, in the regional communities and local communities, national communities with online stuff, bring them to us and just expose everybody to what's going on. Um, and then after that, you know, making sure that we're offering, you know, degree programs, um, and, and, and a culture, um, that students can relate to and will feel um, com- comfortable and respected uh, in um, this generation needs to feel comfortable, or they're just not going to do anything. Mm-hmm. And and that's I respect that. It wasn't it certainly wasn't that way when I went to school. Nobody cared how we nobody cared about our comfort level. In some ways, level. it was the opposite. It yeah, was, yeah. It was, yeah. <laughs> yes, a lot of times it was the opposite. Um, but I I respect that, and 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 you know that is something that is that it, I'm kind of you know, cognizant of in terms of the generational differences. So, you know, you know, we're, we're looking at the curriculum, you know, I, I talk a lot about, you know, being a place um, that is supportive of the 21st century artist, you know, not necessarily the 21st century horn player or musician, but artists. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, taking more of a, a holistic approach to what we're doing. Um, we're not just musicians. We're not just playing music all the time. Um, and that music is a tool that we use to communicate and to teach and to educate and to make people feel and to, you know, have shared experiences. It's so powerful. It's such a powerful tool. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not the point. Like the right. music itself is not the point. And so so far, so good. You know, the things that we've done in terms of getting the, the, you know, exposing our students and our faculty to um, people outside of the university is going well. We'll see. You know, like I said, it, it takes time. Um, but I like it. I, I, I enjoy, you know, 
I enjoy the, 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 the grind, you know, and this is the horn player coming out, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> coming out in me, you know, the, I don't, I don't have any problems putting my head down and grinding, mm -hmm. uh, grinding away at something. So we'll see. Well, they're lucky to have you for sure. Thank you. So, Thank you. And, uh, I guess to sort of wrap things up and kind of bring things back full circle to the, to the IHS. And is there anything you might share to maybe the younger up, up and coming generation of horn players about maybe the importance of the International Horn Society, if there's been any any way that the IHS has been meaningful to you and maybe some words of encouragement to, to folks who are maybe on the fence about joining, because let's face it, there's so many ways to get your horn related information today that it's not like in the old days where you kind of had to read the horn call to see what was going on. Uh, it's not like that anymore, but I still think the IHS has a place and an important place for, for horn players uh, all over the world. That's the goal anyway. But <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I was always, you know, when I was coming up, even though I was not that serious, right, about the horn when I was younger, I was a member of IHS when I was a kid. That's cool. And, and I took a lot of pride in that. And, you know, again, I wasn't in some, you know, music program where there was a million horn players or, or, or even really kind of talking to a, to a horn teacher. I was kind of on my own doing this, this IHS thing. And I remember getting my, my first IHS card in the mail and, I, and getting the horn call. Mm -hmm. And for me, um, back in the day, um, when I was younger, um, IHS was really cool because it was the one thing that made me feel like I'm part of this huge horn family community tribe. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing else really made me feel that way because I kind of wasn't. Um, in, in the horn playing world other than that, uh, other than playing in band. Um, so that was really cool for me. It was really fascinating, you know, to see and to hear and to read about, of course, the, the, the great, you know, the great players and the, the, the history. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I learned a lot, um, but I wasn't, you know, how do I say this? I, I learned a lot and I, and I, was almost like uh, an, an outsider looking in when I was a kid. And, you know, in terms of how I see it now, you know, the world is shrinking, you know. It, you know, young people now, it's nothing for them to have, you know, friends in different towns and different states, in different right. countries, you know, on different continents. They listen to all kinds of music. The horn is something that they do. They're passionate about it. but. They're, they are global citizens, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, it is really cool that we have an organization, um, the horn players of the world, you know, have an organization where we can, you know, share this love of horn playing and we can have symposiums and we can have workshops and we can, you know, we can share, you know, the rich traditions and history of horn players, you know, going back, you know, to the beginning of civilizations around right. the world. We're just scratching the surface in terms of what we actually even know about horn playing around the world. So um, in that regard, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, stick around and, you know, definitely participate in, in as much as you can. Um, it is, I have found it to be um, really, really um Really, really cool to be supported by horn players uh, from around the world, especially you know from around the United States, but also from around the world. And we we all have so much in common. We just need to have opportunities to uh, to meet, greet, and support each other. Thank you so much, Larry. That's this has been great. Thank you, thank you, James. Good to see you. Good to see you too.